Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie, and this is episode number 836 for September 13th, 2020. Coming up in a few minutes. They're all Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but now, you know, we're all humans, but we all look different. So these are all cerevisiae, but they all act differently in whatever environment you put them in. Some are particularly good for wine, some are particularly good for whiskey or distilling in general. Others are really good for making soy sauce. After our deep dive into American White Oak last month with forestry scientist Tom Kimmerer, we had requests to do something similar with yeast. And we're rising to the occasion. Matt Bachman is an associate professor of biochemistry at Indiana University. His formal research uses yeast to help understand how cells work and fight cancer. But he's also a home brewer and consults with distillers and brewers on fermentation. I'll talk with Matt Bachman later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. That's just ahead, along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice, the calendar of events, and... Whoa. We've done it. I don't know if, I, if any of you guys have done it, but we've done it. Have you? We have. Yeah, back in the wow. back when we were preparing for, it was actually, I'm proud to say, my idea. Just what did David Blackmore and the folks at Ardbeg do? The answer is coming up later on Behind the Label. But here's a hint. Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. While the coronavirus pandemic has dominated headlines for most of this year, we need to return to Brexit for a moment. That's right, we're still discussing Brexit, Great Britain's exit from the European Union. While the UK officially left the European Union at the end of January, it remains bound by the transition agreement that defines Great Britain's trade with the EU until the end of 2020. Now, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's government is apparently planning to renege on part of that agreement, specifically where it comes to Northern Ireland. Legislation to be sent to Parliament this week would ensure free trade between the UK mainland and Northern Ireland. While the agreement specifies that Northern Ireland will remain subject to EU trade rules for at least four years in order to keep an open border with the Republic of Ireland. Analysts say that would likely crater the ongoing negotiations between the UK and European leaders on a long-term trade deal and that would have a serious impact on whiskey makers in Scotland, Wales, England, and Northern Ireland. While we don't have a lot of export data for Wales, England, and Northern Ireland, we do know that the 27 remaining European Union countries remain the largest single export market for Scotch whiskey makers, accounting for 30% of all Scotch whiskey exports in 2019. That makes a trade deal critical for the UK's whiskey producers. While protecting the open border between Ireland and Northern Ireland remains critical to preserving the peace process in Northern Ireland. Turning back to the pandemic now, pubs in Ireland have been closed since March, but as of now, will be allowed to reopen starting next Monday with tight restrictions. No one will be allowed to stand at the bar, and all patrons will have to be seated at tables. That decision applies to so-called wet pubs that only serve drinks. Pubs that also serve food were allowed to reopen back in June, with mandatory food purchases required in order to get drinks. The rule applies nationwide, but local governments will be allowed to impose more severe restrictions if COVID-19 cases keep rising. That is the case in Dublin, where health officials are warning that the number of cases could double over the next two weeks. And Prime Minister Taoiseach Michael Martin warned this weekend that the government will not hesitate to reimpose lockdowns 
if necessary. In England, pubs and restaurants now have to collect contact information from patrons to assist with contact tracing if a COVID-19 case is confirmed. That data will be held for 21 days, and until now, contact collection had been voluntary, while more than groups of six people are banned. Elsewhere, Florida will allow bars in that state to reopen starting Monday with indoor seating limited at 50% of capacity. Bars there have been closed since late June. Bars in Las Vegas will remain closed for now after Nevada officials cited consistently high cases of COVID-19, while Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards announced that bars in his state's parishes with a 5% or lower coronavirus infection rate for a two-week period, will be allowed to reopen if local health officials agree. However, capacity will be limited, and a 10 p.m. last call will be in effect. Regional governments in Spain have ordered bars to now close at 1 a.m., while officials in Australia's state of Victoria have unveiled a plan to gradually start easing that state's lockdown restrictions. Pubs there may be able to resume outdoor service by the end of next month if COVID cases keep dropping. Back in June, we reported on the new partnership between Vaughn Weaver of Uncle Nearest Tennessee Whiskey and Jack Daniels' parent company Brown Foreman to create the Nearest and Jack Advancement Initiative. The goal is to increase opportunities in the whiskey industry for people of color. In addition to working with the new Nearest Green School for Distilling at Motlow State College in Tennessee, the project also has a mentorship initiative for entrepreneurs looking to start new brands and a leadership advancement initiative to help people of color already in the industry move into leadership positions. That program now has its first participant. Former Glenfiddich brand ambassador Tracy Franklin was one of our guests on the Whiskey Wednesday webcast the other night. She told us she hung out in the lab and the distillery at Glenfiddich as much as she could to learn more because she wants to become a distiller one day. I want to ensure that this program is successful. It is a solution. Like Fawn Weaver saw a problem. She created a program that would then, just like you said, we are creating the candidates we want to to hire. Because there was was no way that, that this was going to be able to happen. There was a reason that we are underrepresented within the spirits and the, the, the brewery industries. We are going to be represented, underrepresented, not just because of the experience, but also in the way that family is it's a familial thing you you raise up your family through your distilleries and if we don't have that if that ancestry and that legacy has been cut off we don't have those ties to kind of move up in the industry and to become that master distiller because my dad was which is not a bad thing i think it's incredible and awesome and we will honor those legends and traditions forever but this new chapter will also be a little bit more colorful a little bit more complete and i'm really excited about that There's no timetable for Tracy to complete the program. Other participants will be announced in the coming months. We were also joined Wednesday night on the webcast by Garrett Oliver. He's the brewmaster at Brooklyn Brewery in New York. And earlier this summer, he founded the Michael Jackson Foundation for Brewing and Distilling in honor of the late whiskey and beer writer. Like the Nearest and Jack Advancement Initiative, Its purpose is to help people of color advance their careers in brewing and distilling with scholarships to pay for tuition and has the blessing of Michael Jackson's family. But, as Garrett told us, the Foundation's roots actually go back 20 years or so to the old Michael Jackson Fund for Brewing and Distilling, which was run back then by the American Institute of Wine and Food. Garrett is hoping to solve the problem of systemic racism within the drinks industry. It's a problem that, you know, we all have something to do with. You know, everybody wants to say, oh, well, it wasn't me. But in fact, you know, even I had to take a look in the mirror and just say, well, why haven't I had uh, any applicants for a brewing job, black African, uh, uh, black uh, African-American for a brewing job in 30 years? Wow. I have sent uh, I have sent Iraqis to brewing school, and I've sent Haitians to brewing school. I've sent people from other countries. I've sent Americans of other backgrounds to brewing school. 
but I've never even had an applicant, you know, from the black community in the United States. And there are reasons for that. And one of the many reasons uh, uh, involves, yes, we have very high standards of either education or experience. And when it comes down to both of those things, there are not many people out there with experience, about 1% or less of people in the brew houses in the United States uh, uh, are, you know, are African-American. And then you have uh, on the technical side where we're requiring experience or coursework, the coursework starts maybe for short courses at about $2,500. And if you're looking at UC Davis, you're looking at $16,000 for a population of people who have 10% of the household wealth of other Americans in the United States. So, you know, even someone who is myself, a person of color, sitting in a chair uh, uh, where I could hire people, I actually had set up a system that virtually ensured that nobody of my own background would end up in front of me for this job. It wasn't intentional, but it's what happened. And so what we're looking to do with the Michael Jackson Foundation is very simple and very streamlined. There's only one thing we actually do. Well, two related things. The first thing is that we offer scholarship awards uh, for people of color within uh, the technical production side of brewing uh, and distilling. Uh, we will have an accredited list. We're working with people like UC Davis and the Master Brewers Association of the Americas, and we hope to also work with the distilling industry to figure out what our accreditation list is, which will all be vetted uh, pretty seriously. And then we send people out for these courses. You know, they will obviously apply to us through a scholarship uh, as a normal scholarship. Uh, we will then pay the schools directly. The second part of it, however, is that every person who gets a scholarship will be assigned a mentor uh, who will be a person of color within the industry, preferably somebody who got in in the last 10 years or so and can remember what it was like uh, you know, before they were a known person like myself um, and can give, uh, be a listening ear, give advice, but importantly, also make connections. The program's scholarships have been named for Nearest Green in Distilling, and Sir Jeff Palmer in brewing. Sir Jeff is a professor emeritus at Scotland's Harriet Watt University School for Brewing and Distilling. In other news, we now have word that Diageo does plan to open its new Johnny Walker experience in Edinburgh, Scotland, next summer. The visitor's experience is under construction in the old House of Fraser building on Princes Street in downtown Edinburgh, and was originally scheduled to open this summer before the coronavirus pandemic shut down work on the project. Diageo launched the Experiences website this week and is now pre-registering people with interest in being among the first to visit the center when tickets go on sale in the near future. September is Bourbon Heritage Month, and this coming week would usually bring the annual Kentucky Bourbon Festival in Bardstown. As we reported several weeks ago, this year's festival is being delayed until a month from now and will be online only. One event will still have to take place with people in person. The annual World Championship Bourbon Barrel Relay Competition, it pits distilleries against each other in team and individual competitions for both men and women. While that event is usually one of the most popular each year, Bourbon Festival President Randy Process says this year's competition will have to take place behind closed doors. They certainly love the crowd. They love the competitiveness of being there against each other and have, you know, the tailgating and all of that. So, I mean, that piece will be gone, but we didn't want to not have this event. So we're going to do it in a kind of a closed set. We're going to build it and have it set up and have scheduled time. I mean, they're not running against each other anyway. They're running against the clock. So we felt like we could still produce that. We're going to pre-record it. We're going to make sure the weather conditions and everything, if we end up spilling over from one day to the next, which I don't think we can, I think we can still get everybody done in one day. We'll edit the video and then we'll air it on Sunday to close out the event. This year's Bourbon Festival online events are scheduled to take place from October 15th through the 18th. And while the festival itself may be delayed, the usual round of new bourbon announcements right around festival time is on schedule. Brown Foreman unveiled the third annual release of its King of Kentucky bourbon 
As part of the company's 150th anniversary celebration, this year's release is a 14-year-old bourbon with 37 single barrels, all bottled separately. ABVs will vary from 62.5% ABV to 67.5% depending on the individual barrel, but the recommended retail price will remain the same around $250 per bottle. I'll have my tasting notes for it later on. Heaven Hill is releasing the annual Parker's Heritage Collection Limited Edition this month. The 2020 edition is a 10-year-old bourbon matured in heavily charred barrels. Those barrels were charged to a level 5 char compared to the usual level 3 char Heaven Hill uses. It's the bourbon companion to last year's Heavy Char Rye Edition and is bottled at 60% ABV. It'll be available for a recommended retail price of $120 a bottle. And once again this year, Heaven Hill will donate a portion of the sales of each bottle to the ALS Association in Parker Beam's memory. Buffalo Trace has announced the 2020 Antique Collection Whiskies, with the George T. Stagg Bourbon, the William LaRue Weller Weeded Bourbon, the Eagle Rare 17-Year-Old Bourbon, the Sazerac 18-Year-Old Rye, and the Thomas H. Handy Uncut and Unfiltered Sazerac Rye. All five will be available in limited amounts starting next month, with the official recommended retail price set at $99 each. I will not have tasting notes for the antique collection this year, Buffalo Trace advised that all of its review samples had been claimed within 25 minutes of the news release being emailed Wednesday. My request went in 26 minutes after that. Wyoming Whiskey will be releasing its annual batch of Outrider Monday to consumers in Wyoming with bottles available in other states soon. This whiskey was created by Wyoming Whiskey's original master distiller, Steve Nally, back in 2011, when he defied a request to make a rye whiskey by instead distilling a whiskey with a high rye mash bill just under 50% rye. Of course, ryes do have to be made from at least 51% rye. That whiskey has been blended with a traditional bourbon mash bill. This year's release is eight years and eight months old. There's no word on pricing. And Few Spirits is releasing its Immortal Rye, which was reduced to bottling proof after the barrels were dumped with the Eight Immortals Tea from Denver's The Tea Spot. 6,000 bottles will be available in the U.S. for around $45 a bottle. Let's turn now to Scotland, where Art Begg's Mickey Heads is retiring at the end of the month after 13 years as distillery manager as we reported last week, Colin Gordon is leaving Lagavulin to move down the road and take over for Mickey. On our Happy Hour webcast Friday night, longtime listener Graham Frazier asked David Blackmore to address rumors on social media that Art Begg will be releasing a special whiskey to honor Mickey Heads. Yes, there will be a release uh, to... Uh, celebrates the wrong word. Celebrate the 13 years of amazing service he's uh, he's had with us. Um, launch date for that um, is a is very much up in the air right now um, for various logis- logistical reasons. We've had a couple of uh, slowdowns on it, so um, ask you to be patient on that. It might not be quite as soon as we we had hoped, as I had hoped as a our big fan. But yeah, there is something coming. We'll have more details on that special release when it's available, and we do plan to have Mickey Heads on one of our live webcasts soon. I'll keep you posted when we have that confirmed. We'll also have more from the Happy Hour webcast later in the show. Aberfeldy is releasing a new 18-year-old single malt. The French red wine cask expression is finished in Bordeaux red wine casks. It'll be available exclusively at the distillery and its online shop for the next month and will then be rolled out in the U.S., France, Germany, Taiwan, and China. The recommended retail price, 95 pounds a bottle. That's about $113 and euro at current exchange rates. 
White & Mackay is releasing a new 46-year-old Federcairn single malt. It was distilled in 1973 and spent its first 42 years in ex-bourbon barrels before spending the last four years in tawny port pipes. Only 5,500 bottles will be available in the UK, Europe, and Asia, with a recommended retail price of £8,500, about $10,100. In Ireland, Jameson is releasing a new version of Jameson Crested Irish Whiskey. It's finished in Black Ball Metric Stout beer barrels from 8 Degrees Brewing in County Cork. Jameson Parent Irish Distillers acquired 8 Degrees a couple of years ago to ensure a beer partner for its Jameson Caskmates whiskies following the sale of Franciscan Well Brewery in County Cork. Jameson Crested is normally available only in travel retail, but this edition will be on sale at the Jameson Visitors Centers in Dublin and Middleton for €45 Euros a bottle. It will also be available at the Dublin Airport's Irish Whiskey Collection Shop starting next month. And the folks at the Celtic Whiskey Shop in Dublin have launched a new independent Irish whiskey range. The Celt is a derivative of the shop's longtime Celtic cask releases, and this one will feature whiskies from some of Ireland's newer distilleries as they mature. The initial release is being called First Taste, and is a single malt finished in sherry casks from an undisclosed distillery. It'll sell for €75, Euros, about $89 a bottle. This whiskey will also help make up for some of the impact from the cancellation of Whiskey Live Dublin this November. Some of the proceeds from Whiskey Live Dublin each year go to Down Syndrome Dublin. But with that not possible this year, the Celtic Whiskey Shop will donate €5 Euros for each bottle sold of the Celt to the charity. And finally, from the Crime and Punishment Department, since we're talking about Irish whiskey, Conor McGregor is in legal trouble yet again. The mixed martial arts fighter and face of proper number 12 Irish whiskey was arrested this weekend on the French island of Corsica, after an incident at a local bar. He's been accused of attempted sexual assault and indecent exposure, according to Corsican officials. No other details about the incident have been released, and a spokesman for McGregor's management firm denies all of the allegations. McGregor was questioned by police and then released. It's the latest in a series of incidents that McGregor has been involved in, since he launched the Proper Number 12 brand two years ago this month. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at WhiskeyCast.com. Don't forget our live webcasts are back after taking the month of August off. We're live on Wednesdays and Fridays starting at 5 p.m. New York time. That's 10 p.m. London time and 2100 GMT. You can catch them on our YouTube channel, Facebook page, Twitter, and Periscope. Time now for the calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. First off, the Hong Kong Whiskey Festival that had already been rescheduled for October 11th has now been postponed until next April. And Whiskey Live in Changsha, China, the weekend of October 24th and 25th, has been canceled with plans to return sometime in 2021. Whiskey Advocate magazine has now postponed Whiskey Fest New York from October 29th until December 8th. If that date holds, and there are no guarantees right now, it means three Whiskey Fest events in the space of one week, starting in San Francisco on December 4th, New York City on the 8th, and Chicago on the 11th. As of now, Whiskey and Barrel Night is still on for this Wednesday in Paramus, New Jersey, using an outdoor venue to comply with New Jersey state health restrictions. Druitts will hold a live online auction of rare spirits and wines on Thursday the 17th. The virtual edition of Tales of the Cocktail gets underway next Monday and will run through the 24th. McTeers will hold its next whiskey auction September 25th in Glasgow, Scotland. 
Forty Creek Distillery has the virtual version of its annual Whiskey Weekend on September 26th. And the Whiskey Exchange's virtual version of the Whiskey Show London will take place online October 2nd through the 9th. Of course, all in-person events are subject to change on short notice, depending on public health restrictions. So make sure you double-check before you make any travel plans. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of Virginia's most awarded spirits. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states, three continents, and online. Visit the Where to Buy page at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com to find a retailer near you. And please drink responsibly. The search never ends, but it's nice when you can come in for a landing, pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey, matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. There are three basic ingredients in whiskey grain, water, and yeast. We know a lot about grain and water, but yeast's mysteries have been baffling scientists for centuries. In fact, whiskey was being distilled from fermented mash long before humans ever figured out how fermentation works in the first place. And there are still a lot of things we don't know about how yeast works. Matt Bachman knows a lot about yeast. He's an associate professor of biochemistry at Indiana University in Bloomington, and his research focuses on using yeast cells to help unlock clues to fighting cancer and other diseases. But he also works with yeast at home as an occasional home brewer. He also consults with distillers and brewers to help them solve issues with fermentation. Full disclosure, I am an Indiana University alumnus, and when I use College of Arts and Sciences, sent out an email for a webinar with Matt Bachman the other night with the title, Yeast, Bread, Booze, and Biology, well, I cleared my calendar for that on the spot and tracked him down to join us this week. How did you get involved in biochemistry and what prompted you to start studying yeast, of all things? Um, so this was, well, it's a long time ago now, I guess, better part of 20 years. Uh, I was an undergrad at Juniata College and I, I was a junior fall semester. I dropped all my classes because I hated them um, and I decided I was going to write my own major. And one of the courses I took had a co-requisite of independent research. I decided, hey, why not give it a try? I'd done biology lab, chemistry lab. How bad could it be? And I loved it. I got into a lab and it wasn't cookie cutter science. You know, it wasn't a project you already know the answer to. And you're just trying to teach somebody how to use a pipette. This was, uh, this was brand new. It was a problem to solve. And it was sort of good and bad because I liked lab so much, my grades suffered. <laughs> I just stayed in lab and stayed, stayed out of the classroom. Uh, but I got, I was working in a, a lab that used yeast as its model organism, and I've been doing it ever since. What makes yeast so unique? Uh, it's the, the simplest cell or the simplest kind of cell that we know about that's similar to a human cell. So it's, it's a eukaryote. It's a cell with a nucleus. So are human cells. But uh, a yeast is single cell. It's, it's like a bacterium. It's small. It's microscopic. But most of the machinery that drives the life of a yeast cell is the same machinery that drives a human cell. So we can learn lots about how, you know, how we work metabolically and things like that and lots about human disease by studying yeast. How did we discover, though, its benefits in fermentation? Because that was done centuries ago, right? Well, it was done thousands of years ago. I mean, it was Aristotle is the first one. This was, you know, 2,500 years ago. The, the Greeks uh, produced the first written document of fermentation science. And they knew, you know, if you took sugar water, something like, like grape juice, um, and let it sort of sit out, it would, it would naturally ferment and you would get a sediment on the bottom. And if you pitched that sediment into the next batch of grape juice, the fermentation would start faster. It would go better. 
they didn't know that was yeast. It was an organism per se, but they had a word for it. And that's, you know, eventually what sort of drifted down and turned into our word, uh, you know, the English word yeast. Which we mentioned on uh, Behind the Label, I quoted your webinar the other night, where the Dutch took that Greek word, expanded on it, and then the English took the Dutch word for yeast and turned that into yeast because yeast means boiling in Dutch, right? Exactly. And, you know, a vigorously fermenting liquid looks like it's boiling. And I wanted to give you the credit for that, as we did last week <laughs> on the show, because I had not heard that before, how yeast got its name. Yeah, you know, I, I think I got that from a fabulous book called Proof by Adam Rogers. Um, so I can't take the credit either. <laughs> and Adam has been on our show before, too, several years ago when Proof came out. And I agree that's an outstanding book for anyone who wants to get the yeast, so to speak, or the gist of uh, <laughs> sorry, pun intended, of distilling. It's a great book, and, and I'm a dad, so I love the dad jokes, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. And speaking of dad jokes, the common one is that, okay, you put yeast into the wash, and it basically eats the sugars and excretes the alcohol, for lack yeah. of a better term. You're drinking so, yeast pee. Yep, we're drinking yeast pee. And that seems about like the typical eight-year-old joke for a lot of folks, but it really is the truth, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. How does this process work? Let's explain, first of all, how it works, and then go into how we figured this out years ago. Okay, so it's this is, you know, central metabolism. If anybody remembers that from high school biology class, you know, your, your body takes energy, you know, well, it takes potential energy in the form of sugars, of, of nutrients, and it runs it through a bunch of metabolic processes uh, you know, all the way into your mitochondria that turn basically carbon flux into into ATP to drive drive energy. Now, the, that's the way most of your cells do it, but a yeast cell can do this in the absence of oxygen, right? So this is the the anaerobic metabolism or what we call fermentation. Um, and instead of most of that sugar energy going then to make ATP for the cell, uh, you get a little bit of ATP, but you get more waste product. In this case, it's carbon dioxide and it's alcohol. And that's what the yeast is excreting. That's waste, but that's what we want. The carbon dioxide, those are the bubbles in our beer. And the alcohol, that's, you know, that's the alcohol in the beer or that's distilled down to, to whiskey and whatever. Um, it's, it's not unlike what happens in your muscles. You know, if you exercise too vigorously, your muscles uh, lack oxygen and they go anaerobic as well. In that case, instead of it being an ethanolic fermentation, it's a lactic acid. And so it's that lactic acid buildup that gives you muscle aches. I don't quite know, you know, evolutionarily how that evolution diverged from lactic acid versus ethanolic. It'd be interesting if you exercise too much and you get drunk. <laughs> That's not quite the way it works for humans, though. And, of course, if you drink too much alcohol, you get headaches instead of muscle aches. Yeah. <laughs> how did we figure this out, though? Who were the scientists in the 1800s that figured this out? Because we had distillation long before we had an idea of what was creating the alcohol in the first place. Yeah, you know, this this story go, goes way, way back, and it really parallels modern Western science. You know, all, all the sort of big names you may have learned about in, in high school or college, uh, they, they pop up in this, this story of figuring out what yeast is and how ethanolic fermentation works. And so, you know, literally the first people that invented a microscope, or at least a microscope that worked very well, so this was Antoine von Leeuwenhoek, the first thing he did was look at fermenting beer, <laughs> right? And he saw, you know, these little round things and thought, well, maybe those are the agents of fermentation. Those are something that that's fermenting. And, you know, you, you fast forward into the uh, sort of the, the French Revolution. There was, you know, the wine industry has always been big in France and lots of batches of wine went bad. Right. And people didn't know why it's because some some had yeast in them, some had bacteria instead of yeast. And you'd get that lactic acid fermentation. And so uh, I believe it was a gentleman by by the name Lavoisier, uh, not, not Courvoisier, but Lavoisier <laughs> is the one that came up with the, the conservation of, of mass theory. So if you have a chemical reaction, if you take 10 grams of something and 10 grams of something and you react them, you get 20 grams out. So in, in the case of something like fermentation, that was uh, a difficult thing to measure because you're losing some of that mass as carbon dioxide. It bubbles away, but you can catch that and you can weigh it all. 
Louis Pasteur got involved again in France. You know, this was before he was famous for pasteurization. Again, he got involved in uh, the, the French um, wine and uh, I can't remember if it, if it was wine or if it was some other uh, liqueur. Uh, but again, you know, it was good batches versus bad batches. And he said, well, if, again, if we look at this microscopically, we see large round cells, which we know now are yeast in the good batches and these small rod shaped cells in the bad batches. And he said, OK, it must be these round cells that are the, the agents of fermentation. And eventually it all boiled down to the late 1800s. Chemists and biologists got together. It was actually a set of brothers, the Buchner brothers. They grew up yeast. You know, the, this was a hypothesis. Now it's yeast are the agents of fermentation. They grew them up. They ground them up and then they fractionated them and they found a fraction. So, you know, a biochemical mix of enzymes from the cells that if you just add it straight to sugar and water, you could turn that into alcohol and carbon dioxide. So it wasn't just the yeast themselves that were fermenting. It was the enzymes inside of the yeast. And that was, you know, that's a short history of science, but that's also the beginning of enzymology and biochemistry, my, my chosen field. <laughs> This was a big battle, though, between the chemists and the biologists of the day, though, as to what was causing this, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the chemists, you know, naturally thought everything was a chemical process. You didn't need biology involved at all. You know, yes, there, there may be yeast in the sugar water, but they're not really doing anything. The, the yeast die, they break down, and that decomposition process releases energy into the system. And that energy smashes into hydrocarbons, sugar smashes the atoms apart and then they spontaneously recombine into another hydrocarbon which we know is ethanol you know it sounds silly today but that was cutting edge science in the, the 1800s and the biologists knew better right well the biologists, they thought they did they, they thought they did right they they had um they hypothesized that okay we, you know we think every, every living thing is made of cells we see cells that grow and divide in a fermenting beer or a fermenting whiskey wash um, so that must be what's, what's doing the fermentation. And if we kill those cells and we put them back into sugar water, nothing happens. And it, it must be, you know, you need that live cell. So it really wasn't until, till Pasteur who, who did the proper experiment, right? He, he subcultured the round cells and, and the, the rod cells, the bacteria and the yeast, and he s separately inoculated sugar water or grape juice or what have you. Uh, I think it was actually beet juice at the time. And sure enough, the, the yeast would always make uh, the good tasting product and the bacteria would always make the bad tasting product. And he could heat kill one or the other and you wouldn't get anything to happen. And so he, he really had causation at that point. He almost had the smoking gun until, you know, the, the Buchner brothers sort of wrapped it up in a bow for everybody. We talk about the basic yeast used in brewing and distilling Saccharomyces cerevisiae. I think I got that right. My Latin is yes. not good. But... That's more of a real family of yeast, isn't it? Because there are so many different strains of yeast that produce so many different flavors that it's not just one type of, you can't order up a Saccharomyces cerevisiae from the yeast store and get this generic yeast and still get good whiskey out of it or good beer. You've got to use something a little more specialized, right? Yeah, you know, that's um, when you really get into the microbiology, that's, that's when lines between species really get blurred, especially with bacteria. It's terrible to try to tell two bacteria apart. It's a little bit easier with yeast, but it's it's still rough. And Saccharomyces cerevisiae is what I call it. I'm from Pittsburgh, though, so I barely speak English. <laughs> so don't, don't judge me on the pronunciation either. Um, but yeah, I mean, baker's yeast and brewer's yeast and the yeast I use in the lab, they're all the same species. They're all Saccharomyces cerevisiae. But if you took one of my lab strains and you put it into a, a whiskey mash, or if you took a wine strain and you try to put it into a beer, uh, it may or may not work for fermentation. It may or may not taste good at the end. So there are, um, you know, some people call them strains. Some people call them isolates. Some people call them subspecies. They're all Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but now, you know, we're all humans, but we all look different. So these are all cerevisiae, but they all act differently in whatever environment you put them in. Some are particularly good for wine, some particularly good for whiskey or distilling in general. Others are really good for making soy sauce. But why? Why do different strains or isolates produce different flavors? Do we know that? 
Uh, some have been selected that way. Uh, so, so humans, you know, they, they, they started with spontaneous fermentation. They had an, an open vessel of sugar water. Mother Nature sprinkled in whatever kind of microorganism she was going to, and they tasted at the end. If it tasted good, they'd, they'd take that sediment and pitch it into the next batch, and they kept doing that for generations, right? Um, and so we selected for organisms that performed under the conditions we wanted them to. So whether it was a warm fermentation or a cold fermentation, so an ale versus a lager. Um, whether it was something that had maltose as the main sugar in a beer or it had something like fructose as a main sugar in a, a fruit wine. And so you, you can actually sort of trace back the evolution of, of lots of, of beer yeast versus soy sauce yeast versus wine yeast. Uh, and you can you can see them sort of cluster together, all the beer strains cluster, all the wine strains cluster. Uh, but you can also see multiple domestication events. So you know, there's the the English brewing tradition or the British brewing tradition. There's a set of English strains that are particular versus the German strains versus the Belgian strains. Uh, and it, it all comes down to really metabolic byproducts. These things are making compounds that are, you know, flavor compounds or aroma compounds that are different from, from other strains. Um, and some of those were to attract fruit flies. You know, yeast don't move. Yeast don't have legs or flagella or anything. They can't move around, but they could hitch a ride on a fruit fly and go from one tree to the next. So it's, it's, it is curious how all these, these strains and dif differences between strains evolve, and that's what people are still working on today. And there's wild yeast, in addition, that exists all around us. You could put a Petri dish out with something, and the yeast in the natural air would ferment it, theoretically, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, my, my lab's gone out and, and harvested wild yeast from, you know, all, all around Indiana and any, anywhere I travel. We've got probably 400 strains in the freezer now. And these are things that nobody has ever fermented with, but they, they can certainly make beer or make whiskey or make whatever you want to ferment. They can make bread. And they're also good for scientific research, too. Let's uh, talk about what you're doing in the biochemistry field with yeast that may have bigger impacts for us as a civilization than just making beer and whiskey, which of course is important, but let's be realistic <laughs> here. Yeah. So, so I, I am the local yeast whisperer, but that's not really what pays the bills. You know, I, um, I run a, a biochemistry lab at Indiana university here in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, we're, we're funded by the American cancer society and the national institutes of health. And neither one of those foundations cares about making alcohol. We use yeast as a model system. Again, so it, it's a, a model of a, a human cell, for, for lack of a better term. Um, and we're trying to figure out uh, sort of the basic biology of a cell. How, how is DNA copied? How is DNA repaired when it's damaged? And what happens when things go wrong? And are there targets, you know, druggable targets that then we can we could treat to fix this? And, you know, there are lots of cases of human diseases where there's a mutation in a certain protein and you get a disease, but that's going from A to Z with nothing in between. So what does that mutation cause to go wrong in a cell that then eventually precipitates a disease state? We're trying to fill in the gap in the middle, right? So there are uh, the proteins that we study are called DNA helicases. They're the things that unzip the, the DNA double helix. And they're super important for many, many processes in the cell. But other than unzipping the double helix and, causing diseases when mutated, we don't really know what they do. And so that's, that's where we are now, or we're, we're trying to fill in all those black boxes um, to try to learn how a cell normally works and to learn why, you know, for instance, people get cancer when things go wrong. And the same yeast cells that you're working with are the same ones that we enjoy when we drink uh, a glass of whiskey. Exactly. Yeah. You, you can, you can ferment with our lab strains and we can take uh, we can take wild strains and we can look at them in the lab as well. And oftentimes we can learn something by looking at the wild strains because, again, they haven't been domesticated and sort of tamed uh, for generations in a lab. Feral yeast, basically, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you also do some consulting work with the brewing and distilling industries, too, to help make better beer and better whiskey, right? Yeah, you know, I, I'm a science nerd from from all facets. You know, I, I like to homebrew myself, or I did before I had kids and when I had free time. Um, my, my great grandfather and my great, great grandfather were actually brewmasters in Pittsburgh. So there's a bit of a family tradition there. Uh, and when I started a yeast lab, I decided one of the things I wanted to do was give, give a little back to the, you know, the community that I enjoy. I love a craft beer. I love a great bourbon. I love a nice dark rum. So I said, Hey, you know, I've got 15, 20 years of yeast experience. It's obviously not in an industrial fermentation setting, but 
if you're having trouble, maybe I can help you out. Maybe there's something we can do. And, uh, you know, so I've, I've partnered up with a, a number of local breweries here in Indiana, uh, local distilleries as well. And, you know, sort of further afield, we've, we've got consultant gigs on, on both coasts and anybody that comes asking for help, we, we try to help. And uh, we'll put your contact information, your website at IU on there so that uh, on our website as well, so that other distillers can find you and uh, you can uh, help them make better whiskey down the road. That'd be great. Where's the future for this? Where can we, where can we expect this to go? Or since obviously we don't know everything there is to know about yeast, what do we still need to figure out besides how to unzip those helixes? Oh man, that's a loaded question. <laughs> Sorry. The, the amount that we don't know uh, is staggering. <laughs> so, I mean, that's from the basic biology of a cell, you know, how, how every little, every little process works on up to, like I said, you know, to how these things cause disease, uh, you know, maybe more pertinent to the, the, the beverage fermentation side of things. We, we also, we know a ton about Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Again, you know, it's been domesticated multiple times through evolution. We've used it to make tremendous beers, tremendous alcoholic products, but that's one yeast species out of a hundred thousand or maybe a million yeast species that mother nature's created. And what about all the rest of these? You know, there's, there's probably novel flavor and aroma compounds out there that yeast just naturally make that aren't showing up in our fermentations because we're only focusing on cervicia. And so that's why one of the reasons we started to go wild yeast hunting to figure out, you know, what else was in mother nature's toolbox and can we make those tools available to people? And so we've found, uh, we've found strains of, well, we found wild yeast strains, Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast strains that uh, smell and taste like tropical fruit when you ferment with them. So we're talking pineapple, guava, mango, you know, umbrella drink territory, things that taste like fresh strawberries. Um, we found things but you that get those so- in whiskey too. That those same notes come out in some whiskeys. Yeah. Because yeah, you yeah, get yeah. a lot of tropical fruits, coconut, things like that, mango, and a lot of scotch whiskeys. And obviously there's no mangoes or coconuts anywhere in Scotland. Yeah. And you know, some of this is, is barrel, barrel characteristics. Some of it is grain characteristics. You can get lots of it from the yeast and why not start to build recipes to drive, you know, drive flavor and aroma profiles by putting everything together, get, get your, get your fruity wood, get your fr- fruity grain, get your fruity yeast and have a, you know, a, a cherry blast at the end of it. Um, and it's, and like I said, it's not all Saccharomyces cerevisiae. We found wild Britannomyces strains that are normally just considered uh, contaminants. Uh, we've got one that tastes like limoncello when you ferment with it. It's a lemony minty. It's, it's delicious. Uh, we found strains that not only do they make ethanol when they ferment, but they also make lactic acid. So that's like a throwback to that evolutionary split between the two. They can do both. Uh, and you can make a sour beer now with just yeast instead of using yeast and bacteria and then worrying about contaminating your brewing equipment with with bacteria that you, you don't want. We've certainly found yeast that are terrible. <laughs> They're just sulfur bombs. They're nasty, you know, garbage smelling things. Uh, but most of the strains we find are, are neutrals. So I'm convinced and I tell everybody this, that there's lots of craft beer out there that's probably contaminated with wild yeast. And nobody knows because there's there's no indicator. It's, it just makes alcohol and carbon dioxide and you taste your hops and your IPA and there you go. Once again, Matt Bachman is an associate professor of biochemistry at Indiana University. And we've included a link to his program in the show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. During the interview, we mentioned the book Proof by Adam Rogers. You'll find my interview with him from June of 2014 in episode 462 of WhiskeyCast. It's in the archives at whiskeycast.com. And that's WhiskeyCast in depth, brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret, hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskeys comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. And since it's Bourbon Heritage Month, let's look at some bourbons this time around. And we'll start with the fall 2020 release of Old Fitzgerald Bottled and Bond Bourbon from Heaven Hill. This 14-year-old release comes from barrels filled during the fall season of 2005. The nose has notes of caramel candy, 
oak sawdust, pipe tobacco, honey, and hints of apples and apricots. The taste starts off with black cherries and honey, followed by a burst of black pepper and allspice notes that fade to a nice balance with a hint of pipe tobacco in the background. The finish is long with hints of spices and oak, balanced by black cherries, honey, and caramel. I'm scoring the Old Fitzgerald Bottled in Bond Bourbon Fall 2020 release a 94. Next up, I mentioned Brown Foreman's 2020 edition of the King of Kentucky Bourbon during the news. This one is also 14 years old, and since it is a single barrel release, the strength will vary from barrel to barrel. My sample was right in the middle at 65.3% ABV. The nose is sweet and woody with cherry cobbler, vanilla, hints of tree fruits, caramel, and a subtle touch of spearmint. The taste has oak tannins and caramel, complemented by clove and cinnamon spices, vanilla, and hints of cherries, tobacco, and honey. The finish, subtle and slightly astringent, with touches of oak, cherries, and lingering spices. I'm scoring the King of Kentucky 2020 release a 94. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. They'll be releasing the next batch of Penny's Proof soon. It's a preview of Sagamore Spirit Whiskey distilled on site in Baltimore. Last year's first release of samples sold out in hours. And the only way to find out when and how to get your hands on this year's batch is to join Sagamore Spirit's Whiskey Thieves. Sign up today at sagamorespirit.com. Jane Bowie of Maker's Mark was one of the guests on our Whiskey Wednesday webcast the other night, and I had a chance to taste this year's release in the Maker's Mark wood finishing series that she's responsible for. The staves used in the finishing barrels for what's been termed PR5XSE4, that's a very melodious name, isn't it? Well, the staves were crafted to emphasize vanilla notes in the bourbon. It's bottled at 55% ABV. The nose definitely has a lot of vanilla, along with honey, muted spices, and hints of molasses and brown sugar. The taste balances cinnamon, black pepper, and allspice notes with vanilla, honey, brown sugar, and caramel nicely, while the finish is long and sweet with hints of vanilla and oak. I'm scoring the Maker's Mark 2020 Wood Finishing Series Bourbon a 93. And say it with me one more time. PR5XSE4. Of course, bourbon can be made anywhere in the United States. The folks at Still Austin Distillery in Austin, Texas, have released their first straight bourbon. It's dubbed The Musician after Austin's legendary music scene, and is bottled at 49.2% ABV. The nose has notes of caramel apples, honey, soft oak, a hint of peaches, cocoa beans, and tobacco. The taste starts off with chocolate-covered cherries, followed by a burst of black pepper and mesquite spices, while honey, caramel, and vanilla provide complexity in the background. The finish has lingering notes of chocolate-covered cherries and soft spices. I'm scoring Still Austin's The Musician Straight Bourbon, a 91. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,900 different whiskeys from all over the world. You'll find it at whiskeycast.com. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice, and back to that still Austin bourbon for a second. I posted a photo of the bottle this weekend on social media because it has this really cool label designed by Austin artist Mark Burkhart. Chad Ellis of Austin replied with this comment on Instagram. I live right down the road, and the tasting room is great, staff are friendly and accommodating, and I love the model of Texas grain to glass. 
Thanks for always showing love to the little guys as well. Thanks for the kind words, Chad, and thanks for the recommendation on visiting that distillery. I'll try to get down there one day. I mentioned that we would be talking about yeast with Matt Bachman on this episode, Saturday on social media, and at Alan Chanel tweeted this. I'm looking forward to this. Interesting that different yeast strains will provide different flavor notes for a mash bill. How does a distiller choose? Can they taste the difference right after a distillation? Well, that's not something I got into with Matt Bachman since he's not a distiller, but it is a really interesting question. Maybe some of the distillers who listen to Whiskey Cast can share their thoughts with us, and I'll ask some of them in my upcoming interviews. And we had another comment from Texas from Andrew Leitz on last week's interview with Jarrett Dieterle on alcohol laws. Here's what he had to say. I grew up in Indiana and now live in Texas. Stupid liquor laws are a way of life, it seems. Regarding your comment on Amazon running small shops out of business, if they want to proudly display Blanton's for $500 or Weller 107 for $300, then I say bring it on. When I realized that major chains like Specs and Total Wine sell stuff like that at actual retail prices, then that's where my money goes. Thanks for your comment, Andrew. And if you have a comment, question, suggestion, or anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and all those other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. It's hard to keep a secret in the whiskey business, especially when brands have to disclose their plans to some regulators long before they're ready to tell the rest of us. We've talked many times before about the U.S. Treasury Department's Tax and Trade Bureau and its label approval process. The TTB makes all of its approved label applications available for public review on the Internet. It may be the only publicly available registry of government label approvals for new whiskeys anywhere in the world. And since brands often submit their label applications for new releases months in advance, the registry is an easy way to see what they're working on. Or is it? Since there are also people who enjoy checking the registry for newly approved labels and then posting their findings on social media, I used to say that I was surprised brands don't submit fake label applications just to throw everyone off. Not going to say that anymore after the subject came up during Friday night's Happy Hour webcast. My guests were Tish Harkis of Canadian Club, Sailor Guevara of Uncle Nearest, and David Blackmore of Glenmorangie and Art Begg. Wow. We've done it. I don't know if, I, if any of you guys have done it, but we've done it. Have you? You have. Yeah, back in the wow. back when we were preparing for it. was actually, I'm proud to say, my idea. Just... You know, a bit of fun, mess with the Art Beg fan club a bit, <laughs> throw them off the scent. Um, we, when we were preparing for the 200th anniversary bottling for Perpetuum, we also submitted labels for Continuum and various other things that were never going to come out. So that you didn't know which one was the real one. <laughs> that's great. Oh, that's, that's brilliant. Great. We couldn't because... get away with that. We couldn't get away with that up here in Canada. No way. Hey. Well, do you have to submit for label approvals in Canada, Tish? I wasn't sure oh, what the rule was up there. Right down to the bottom line, Mark, you have to, like every single thing on that label has yeah. to be approved. Otherwise, it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, it gets, who, Who's it gets doing rejected. the approving? It's not the provincial governments, right? Oh, federal government. Yeah, federal government. So, okay. Yeah, we, have, we have a full-time excise man. Uh, I call him, well, I think Dave has retired. I used to call him the excise Dave man. But never worked for for the man for the company. Worked for the government, but had a full time job and an office there in Walkerville. We can't get away with anything in Canada. <laughs> I, I love the I love the labels in Canada though that have to be in in French and English. It doesn't leave yeah. a, a lot of space for any design elements. 
It's yeah, just crowned with words. Uh, it's the uh, yeah, Canadian whiskey, Canadian. <laughs> yes. And Catherine yeah. Sakura points out that that is a little evil, but hilarious, David. <laughs> if you watched the webcast Friday night, David said the TTB does charge a fee to submit labels for approval. I did check the TTB's website this weekend to find out what that fee is. And according to the website, there is actually no charge to submit one once a brand already has all of the other federal permits in place. Tish Harkis mentioned that they have to submit labels for approval in Canada, probably because there's rarely any controversy over those labels. We don't hear much about the process. In Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency is responsible for approving whiskey labels, but apparently does not maintain a publicly available online registry. If you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, the calendar of events, my tasting notes, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. We love to hear from you. You can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. WhiskeyCast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2020 and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.